Good morning. This is going to be our last booth presentation for the meeting, so I'm very excited uh, to be here with my friend Muhammad Jafari. I'm Stephen Lane, Chief Clinic Medical Officer at Health Gorilla. What do we call these titles? And, uh, and we're going to talk about some really exciting work that we're doing uh, around sensitive data management, data tagging, and uh, consent management. Uh, we are at the beginning of a journey here, but we've done some important things. Please feel free to sit down. Yeah, I won't be. Have a banana. Enjoy yourselves. Um, so uh, let's just jump right in. I don't have a clicker. That'd be a good thing. So, uh, but what we're going to talk about is the, the critical importance of managing uh, highly sensitive data that is covered by state and federal laws. Uh, today, this data, there we go. Terrific. All right. All right, so uh, we're faced with some long-standing uh, regulations that require us to differentially manage certain types of data. Um, most of you are probably familiar with 42 CFR Part 2 and the importance of uh, protecting substance abuse disorder treatment records. Uh, there's a HIPAA self-pay restriction where you have to manage uh, data differentially. Uh, and then in a, quite a variety of state laws that cover genetic information, HIV test results, adolescent confidential information, uh, et cetera. And these vary from state to state. So if you're managing interstate or nationwide exchange, this gets very complicated very quickly. Um, in May of 2020, I hope everybody here knows, the 21st Century Cures Act final rule came out uh, which prohibited information blocking. And that really changed the balance, uh, if you will, of how we're exchanging data. HIPAA told us when you can exchange data. With information blocking, it tells you when you must exchange data. Uh, so it, it really meant that there's been an acceleration of data availability, data exchange. Some of the, the barriers to data access started have been coming down over the past few years. In June of 22, of course, the Supreme Court uh, overturned Roe versus Wade and the Dobbs v. Jackson women's health decision. Uh, and this really changed interoperability a lot. I mean, suddenly I've been in the interoperability space for 20 years constantly working to make data more available and now suddenly there was this unintended consequence uh, where states that have banned abortion uh, even made it illegal um, basically a number of states have gone in that direction and this introduces risks uh, to both patients and providers when patients either do or have historically received certain reproductive health services that that may be illegal in in their state so there a lot of activity in the development of state uh, privacy laws. Uh, there are general data privacy laws in a number of states, in an increasing number of states, uh, that some of which do exclude health data or exclude providers, uh, but it varies from state to state. Uh, in California, where I live and, and practice, we've had the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act for a number of years. It was updated a couple of years ago to require written consent to release information related to specified sensitive services. So suddenly it's like, how do you know if you're releasing that data? How do you get the consent? I mean, this is a state law, right? It's been around for two years. In Washington, uh, they've got the My Health, My Data Act, again, really meant to protect the sensitive information that, that, are, that is maintained by providers, by payers, by HIEs, et cetera. So since the, the Dobbs decision, uh, a number of states, as I said, have outlawed abortion or, or put limits on when you can get an abortion. And then there are other states that have developed laws to protect the data around abortions. So in Maryland in particular, uh, they have House Bill 812 uh, that really applies to health information exchanges and other electronic health networks and it says if you're going to be disclosing data related to abortion care and other specified reproductive health services you need to get a patient authorization so here again we've got that that authorization or consent requirement that's being introduced at the state level uh, and in the Maryland law they did us a big favor because they specified we're just talking about codified data we're talking about ICD-10 diagnoses, specified procedures, prescribed or administered medications, and DRGs. So, so they sort of said, this is, this is the scope that we're talking about. Their compliance date was going to be the end of last year. It got pushed up to June. They're 
actively working to, uh, to get this on the rails. In California, we passed Assembly Bill 352 that also requires segregation and differential management of information. But here it's not just abortion and related care, it's also gender affirming care and contraception. So you can see that the state are approaching this in different ways. Brian, get me the other mic. Um, in the case of the California bill, they don't specify the codes or the code sets that they're worried about. They just put the words out there in the law and we all have to figure out how that works. Um, this law in California, compliance date is July for entities like Health Gorilla, that's a health information network and exchange, um, but it's not until the beginning of January. Thank you. We'll try this one. Um, for uh, providers, so long as they are actively involved in, uh, in working towards compliance. So uh, there's also a uh, final rule uh, at the um, Office of Civil Rights, uh, which will advance HIPAA protections for reproductive health data. Uh, they will actually modify HIPAA to manage this data differentially. In the case of this role, this federal role, uh, they defined in, in the NPRM reproductive health care uh, as including but not limited to, and you can see the list there, prenatal care, abortion, miscarriage, and then this very vague concept of reproductive related conditions such as ovarian cancer. Well, yes, ovaries are involved in reproduction, you know, so are uteruses and a lot of other things, testicles. Um, so it is it's a little vague still. We'll see what the final rule shows. Uh, this rule was sent to the OMB for review back at the end of January, so we're expecting this quote any day now in federal uh, legislative speak. Um, this one also does require a signed attestation, in this case not from the patient to release the data, but an attestation from the data requestor to say why you're requesting the data, because this has to do with the purpose of the request. So uh, you can see there's a lot of dimensions here coming up that have to be dealt with in a technical system that's going to help you to manage this. So TEFCA, of course, uh, the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, something that we've been very uh, actively working on here at Health Gorilla, requires adherence, of course, to all applicable state and federal laws. It has specific flow-down provisions that apply to all participants and sub-participants related to the privacy and security of data. Um, and it does specify that a, a set of HIPAA privacy rule provisions apply to all participants, even if they are not themselves already HIPAA covered entities or business associates. And you can learn about this online. Um, individual access service, just as an aside, is one of the initial purposes of use in TEFCA. Uh, and in this case, the IAS provider uh, makes the agreement with the patient to request their own data through the framework. Um, and, uh, and it introduces another interesting layer of privacy issues because the patients are now very engaged in collecting their data, in managing their data, and are aware that, that this potentially sensitive data is included in data that they can then facilitate exchange. So, um, so we need to build a data infrastructure to manage the appropriate um, access, exchange, and use of this sensitive data. And this really involves segmenting the data identifying what is the sensitive data, and then managing consents uh, and authorizations, whether those are from the requestor or from the patient themselves. So in order to segment the data, first you have to define and identify the data that you care about. You know, what is this sensitive data? What are you considering abortion and abortion-related services? Then you need to be able to analyze the data and see if it's there and be able to report on that tag the data, and then figure out what your enforcement mechanism is going to be. So, so far, we're up to defining and reporting. And then we're working our way down, down the list here. Um, now, uh, there are a number of different industry initiatives that are focused on this work. And feel free to come forward and sit down. I won't be offended if you get up and leave in the middle. Um, so uh, the Sequoia Project has a privacy and consent work group uh, that is trying to tackle a, a piece of this and to identify gaps methods and, and work on supporting pilots. I'm co-chairing that group. The shift interoperability work group that uh, Mohammed has been super involved in and presented on yesterday is going to stand up a terminology work group to help to identify data val value sets and data stewards to maintain and support those over time. So uh, with regard to identifying the data, you need to start with value sets. Uh, and those value sets, as I mentioned, can come from a number of different code sets. 
Um, we've got diagnoses, medications, procedures, documentation. And, and for these, there are numerous different code sets that might be used, sometimes more than one at the same time. So you can see that the, the list of code sets on the right is longer than, for example, the code sets that were considered in the Maryland law. Uh, and of course, in California, they don't consider code sets at all. So, uh, so we're trying to throw as broad a net as possible so we can do a good job identifying the sensitive data where it exists. Um, we're starting with the focus on reproductive health services, including abortion, pregnancy, infertility, contraception, gender affirming care, and substance use disorder treatment services, because those are sort of the, the high points that seem to have commonality for laws across the country. But, but in truth, these value sets really may need to be developed at the level of the individual regulation and then maintained. And then they have to be maintained over time as new codes come online, et cetera. And old codes are deprecated, but then you still have to watch for them. They're not here. So we've been collaborating initially with AHIMA and more recently with NAC. Uh, AHIMA, the American Health Information Management Association, uh, they help the health information professionals, mostly in health systems, to be able to uh, appropriately manage their data. And they really were focused on the OCR rule. They saw what was in the, the NPRM. They wanted to be ready with value sets. So we've been working with them, and we developed the value set that we're uh, using in our initial build. Uh, since then, we've gotten very close with the folks at NAC. They've got a great uh, informatics team. They had already developed a number of value sets to support their constituents in the community health centers, and they have committed to developing uh, all of the value sets that we need for California's AB 352 by the end of this month. Uh, we are planning to continue to maintain those groupers um, and value sets uh, and are prepared to develop those for state and regulation specific use cases. So again, we're starting with AB 352 in California. Uh, we're gonna be looking forward to final OCR HIPAA rule and, and if that needs value sets for enforcement, we'll do that. And as I said, 42 CFR part two. So all of these value sets going to be posted for public access to the National Library of Medicine's Value Set Authority Center. So anybody, Alameda County, et cetera, who's working on implementing uh, protections for sensitive data will be able to access these value sets. Uh, and they're, as I said, they're going to be maintained as the laws and the code sets, uh, fr frankly, clinical practice uh, continue to evolve. So we want the next slide. There it is. Okay. So again, we're focusing initially on abortion data uh, because that is a hot topic, obviously. In Maryland, we've got 812. In California, we've got 352. And then we've got the states that are either limiting or just frankly outlawing abortion. So what we decided to do for today's presentation was to go into the database at Health Gorilla, a nationwide network, uh, and look to see whether we can, in fact, identify abortion data in our data. So, uh, and uh, this thing wants two clicks. So what we did is we looked at these four states, a couple of small states, a couple of big states, uh, and this was the population of individuals that we have in each of those states. This is out of a total of roughly 27 million individuals in the, the Health Gorilla database. Um, again, Health Gorilla is both an information network and a data platform, so we have the, you know, as, as needed, we maintain data in our platform. It allows us to do just this sort of value-added service. So first we looked for females, um, and not surprisingly, slight majority in each of the states. Then we decided to focus in on uh, women of reproductive age. So there we again, it, it shrunk down substantially. Um, and then we decided to say, well, of those people, how many have data that we've identified in our value sets as representing abortion services? So that's what we did. And lo and behold, we found them. Um, you know, not, not a lot. But, uh, you know, but we, we were in each of those states, we were able to find them in states where abortion is protected, in states where abortion is restricted, and in states where abortion is illegal. Um, so that's really interesting, and I think it's pretty cool that I don't know anybody else who's been able to do this. Um, so uh, Health Gorilla, again, we have only 13,000 females of reproductive age with abortion data in our database of 
well, I think I said 27 million people. But, uh, but again, we've at least demonstrated this, this can in fact be done. Now this is an underestimation, of course, of the women, of these women who've had abortions. Because what we know from the CDC reporting is that basically one woman in 100 has an abortion every year. Uh, of childbearing age. So that's that's sort of what the, the big picture is. How much of that data actually gets into nationwide data exchange is, is a question. Whether we've, we're have missing some of it because it's been miscoded. When you're picking the codes, you have to think about a lot of things. We've, we've run this by a lot of subject matter experts. Oftentimes people will intentionally miscode procedures and diagnoses in an effort to protect their patient. So, so we were looking really just at the abortion codes, not at codes related to miscarriage, et cetera. Uh, but again, so we found it in you know, less than 1%, less than uh, substantially less than 1%, whereas we believe that uh, the number you know, of actual patients with, who've had abortions is gonna be, gonna be higher. So, um, so again, our, our focus is to address these many val code sets, um, we have a problem in that VSAC actually doesn't support all these code sets. So we're going to have to have some secondary mechanism if people want to get uh, code sets that VSAC does not support. And then the plan is to tag the data. Uh, when we, since we have a platform, we can go in and evaluate the data and tag it at rest. But the real goal is to be able to tag it in motion. So as it's simply transmitting across the, tre the TEFCA framework or the existing care quality framework that we can identify that data on the wire and then either tag it just so people who are receiving it know they're receiving it or you know, e limit its access. And in the future, of course, going beyond the codified data and looking at free text data uh, and being able to uh, use NLP and potentially AI to then add tags there. So uh, again, we, we are using rules. We plan to use rules to enforce this. So far, we've just identified and reporting. So then we need to tag the data. We need to develop rules that are sensitive to the existence of the data, um, the applicability of state and federal laws based on the location of the query, the purpose of the query, the source of the query, um, and the, whether there are requirements for specific consent for this data in the context of this specific request. And then in the future, being able to enforce these restrictions um, based on the standards, the technical standards that have been developed, data segmentation for privacy, um, and then evolving standards around HIPAA restrictions. Some of you may know that in HTI-1, the ONC's recently released rules, uh, there was a very slight uh, improvement in, in how to manage HIPAA restrictions, but not, you know, there's anticipation that that will continue to evolve, and then there are privacy exceptions related to information blocking where this is all going to be relevant. So that sort of lays out um, the big picture. Again, we're focused on a number of different statutes, a number of different categories of sensitive data. As you can see, it's, it's all over the map and as, as more states and feds develop statutes, this is going to get increasingly complicated. So again, the goal is to be able to tag the sensitive data both at rest and in motion. Um, each of these requires different technical solutions, as you might imagine. There are pros and cons of each method. And the good news is we have Dr. Jafari here, who is the expert in all of this, to take us through the details. Thank you. So um, these diagrams are based on the open standards, the existing open standards. Uh, uh, particularly these ones are from the DS4P for fire standards. So you can find them online uh, as part of the uh, open standard that's published by HL7. Um, so there's two different approaches to, to labeling and I'm going to go uh, over them one by one here from a technical perspective briefly. And I think ultimately uh, what we need is a combination of both. We need a hybrid approach. None of them is going to solve all of the problems. We, we need to label data at rest and we need to label data on motion. And uh, for both, in order to cover both of those, we need both of these technologies and different paradigms of operations, basically. But the components are very similar. So it's just a different permutation of the components and how they're getting called. Um, with the batch uh, data tagging, basically, we're looking at the data source with data address. 
and we're looking at a batch processor that basically schedules data to be labeled. And this can actually be very uh, creative. It can it can look into like what is more likely to be requested. You know what what uh, what kind of data like what kind of data has a priority to be to be labeled. If you have a very large data set, then you need to kind of make that decision when to start and uh, where what data needs to go first. Um, so and there's also events that can trigger that. There's, uh, uh, for example, if there's new data that's being imported into the system via a bulk import, so that data needs to be queued to be labeled. So all of that is kind of taken care of by the batch processor, and then we have uh, the tagging queue that uh, sort of maintains that, and the tagging queue can also incorporate priorities of, uh, you know, if. If, for example, fresh data comes in and there's legacy data in the queue, that the fresh data needs to take precedence. So there's a lo there's a lot of operationally that can be done there, but ultimately the data gets sub submitted to a tagging service, and the tagging service is a standard uh, component there that basically takes the data, consults the rules, the tagging rules, uh, which includes the value sets that Dr. Lane uh, uh, talked about earlier, and then the output is the tag data. And the tag data gets stored back and persisted into the data source. Uh, so there are some uh, benefits and disadvantages to the, this approach. Uh, first of all, uh, the data can get uh, labeled with outside of a transaction con context. So we're not sort of bound by the live latency requirements for a, a transaction. But then we are missing some of that context. So there are cases where the rules could depend on the recipient. Uh, in this case, the, where, where we are doing the data tagging based on only the content, content of the resource and uh, the, the data that's c contained in the, um, in the clinical data, then in, in these cases we may not need to consider the transaction context, but there are cases where the rule actually hinges on the recipient and the context of the transaction or the purpose of use. So those rules cannot be enforced by this model. Um, the other uh, advantage is that we can actually work with uh, longer term and kind of more computationally heavy processes, um, such as natural language processing. These are things that cannot take place in the context of transaction when we are actually bound by those latency requirements. And uh, there is also the, the problem with uh, tags kind of getting outdated. Like if the data is updated, we tag the data, data gets updated for some reason, then we need to relabel, or the rules change. In, in some very rare cases, the rules change, and then we would have to go back and kind of identify what data is no longer up to date, and we need to do the relabeling. And, and ultimately, from a technical perspective, it also needs to uh, persist the labels, and that's some, something that, uh, in some cases, that's not possible. It would require a standard for persistence, and some of the uh, existing APIs are basically read-only, and you can't really write back, and and that is a restriction on on how you can uh, l uh, save the re uh, the labels, and the ta if if the labels or tags are I'm, I'm using them synonymously, uh, even though they're slightly different. If you look at the, the standard, um, in uh, if 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 you have to store them separately, then there's a more engineering problem about how to connect uh, connect it to the data and ma maintain the link, and then what, s what standards you would want to follow. Um, the on-the-fly model basically does the labeling in the context of the transaction as the data is being requested. So this guarantees that uh, everything is up to date. So basically, th there is a request coming, and there is a broader access control system that uh, kind of inter uh, intervenes in every request. It does the uh, labeling of the data as it happens on the fly, and uh, then it incorporates the label data into the context of the access control decision. So that could lead to blocking access entirely or releasing the data uh, in an abridged form, like something can be redacted from the, the data set that's outgoing. Or it could be released entirely, but with labeled data that sort of carries the rules and the caveats of, of how to process it on the recipient's end. And, uh, and in this case, so we have the advantage of looking uh, at the context of the transaction. We can actually have rules that would depend on the purpose of use or the recipient's identity. Um, so these are the cases. Or the existence of a attestation or consent, right? 
Right. So the consent rules, uh, uh, if, if the consent rules depend on, on an individual recipient or purpose of use of something that actually is in the volatile context of the transaction, then that can be incorporated in, in the access control decision. Um, but the, the disadvantage is that we're bound by the latency requirements for a synchronous transaction. So uh, heavier computations usually are not possible and we will have to do uh, those things offline. So that's why I think there, there needs to be a hybrid approach. Some things need to be done in advance and some things can be done on the, at the time of the transaction. Uh, I think the other advantage from an engineering perspective is that we don't need to persist the labels and there's always going to be up to date and uh, we, we don't need to also rely on an underlying persistence technology. So very quickly, um, Ah, oh, very quickly. I'm. I'm going to just look at the overall architecture. If we incorporate uh, consent management into this process, so so far we've we've shown how how to label the data and how basically access control rules can depend on the labels as a form of metadata. So it's a decision factor, uh, but how to con uh, incorporate the consent decisions into that in a way to allow the patients or the clients in other uh, contexts to specify their preferences and then those rules can get enforced uh, at the time of data access. So this is a very uh, preliminary draft architecture that's based on some of the existing projects and demonstrations. Um, we have the on the right hand side the consent management service so this is basically the interface between uh, patients or clients and the uh, and the rest of the ecosystem so they the, it, there is a user interface with like an app or a mobile app or like a web application where the patient interacts and they basically uh, incorporate and express the rules uh, then that gets turned into a actual computable consent object that is stored in, in this case, a fire server, for example. And then at the time of the transaction, uh, the authorization service enforces a wide range of rules uh, for authorization, including where, where the case depends on the consent decision. And in that case, uh, after tagging the data, uh, which is the data tagging service uh, at, the, at the bottom of the diagram, uh, then we have the metadata to actually look into the consent and the rules and that decision then can be incorporated into overall authorization decision. So if the authorization policies require or uh, deem that the decision b basically is up to the patient, then the consent decision is consulted and then we get the rules computationally and incorporate them uh, and then we decide whether the data should be released or not, or, or whether a modified or a bridge version of the data set is, is, is clear to be released. So I, I'm going to pause here and uh, maybe we can take some questions. Thank you, Thank you. Mohammed. Any, any questions? There's a lot here. Sorry you missed the beginning. You've got to watch the recording. Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is this is really important work. Uh, as I said, you know, some of this has been piloted. Uh, some of it's been done in demonstration projects. None of it's really been done at scale. We're hoping to be able to implement these tools at the level of our QHIN uh, in anticipation of supporting compliance with various state and federal laws. But it, it's a big job, and we've got the right expert to help us do it. Thank you, Dr. Lang.